Hi, my name is David Slater, and I want to talk to you a little bit about encryption. Specifically, the policies that I believe states have to make in order to engage with the principled and practical challenges that encryption will force us to confront. And I'll specifically be focusing on the area of terror. Before that, though, I want to ground encryption in real-world instances. On November 13, 2015, in Paris, a group of terrorists killed 137 people. And a little more than four months later, that same group of terrorists attacked again, this time in Brussels, Belgium. We at this hour of two explosions in a departure lounge at the Brussels airport. These attacks utilized messaging platforms with end-to-end -end encryption. Let me give you some context. It's important to recognize that terrorism is on the rise. While there was a spike in 2001 and a continued growth up until the troop surge in 2007, the true explosion in terms of the frequency of terror attacks and the number of people who have lost their lives has come in the power vacuum created by the Syrian civil war and the rise of organizations like Boko Haram in Nigeria. And while the vast majority of terror does not happen in Western nations, and that's important to recognize, Western countries have a unique infrastructure and resource capacity to engage, and more importantly, create a better globe for everyone. And with this in mind, I believe any comprehensive counterterrorism approach must include banning end-to-end -end encryption. I'll be demonstrating this. <laughs> I, I will be demonstrating this in three different areas. First is how the actual ban will be implemented. Second, why the state should actually do it. But last, the actual implications of preventing end-to-end -end encryption from being a part of our society. First, though, on how this will be implemented. Let's start by looking at what no traditional encryption actually looks like, ground ourselves in some reality here. It's important to notice that there are three keys in this image. And while an Im a message is sent between two different users, other people, passerbyers, can't read that. But in the event that the company wants to, or that law enforcement, for example, compels them, they're able to open that message and read the contents of it and turn it over. End-to-end -end encryption, sorry, <laughs> and turn it over. There we go. End-to-end -end encryption has a notable difference. Only two players in this picture have a key. The reason why that matters is that when a message is sent between two different people, the company, law enforcement, Congress, you, the people, no one can open it. And that's the issue. To be clear, I believe banning end-to-end -end encryption should focus on messaging. Your credit card information or your social security number, that can be protected in any way you want. But I hope to prove to you that messaging lends itself in a unique way to terror and crime when it cannot be read. But first, two different areas of how the ban will actually be implemented. Domestic platforms first. This is easy. Using the judicial and legal power of the state, we can compel companies to use certain techniques that have back doors and make sure that those back doors are available to law enforcement when they need them. Foreign platforms, a little more tricky, but don't worry, we still have tools we can use. Specifically, that would be you, a client, your cell phone or your laptop. That's your internet service provider, AT&T maybe, Time Warner Cable. And that's a server with the information that you want to read, maybe facebook.com. In a normal interaction, you send a request to your ISP and your ISP forwards that request to a server, the server responds, and you get the message. Pretty straightforward. But now let's make it a little bit different. Let's say that this server was in a foreign country and was be in violation of the ban by using end-to-end -end encryption for messaging. Here, when the request goes out, the ISP goes to that server, and thanks to help from organizations like the NSA, like MI6 and the intelligence community, they're able to identify that that server is in violation of that ban and refuse to return that information. Now this is really important because it means we can meaningfully restrict access to this technology. It's something we can do. And also it means that those companies will change how they're acting to other consumers even outside of the Western world, meaning that other countries maybe that don't have that same infrastructure or the capacity to leverage against these companies still get the benefits. So now that I've shown you what the actual, like, uh, what this ban looks like when it's implemented, that's still, I have to prove to you that the state should actually do it. There's a lot of things the state could do that we should, that it doesn't necessarily should do. This comes down to a question of what exactly is the role of the state, and further boil down to a tension between privacy and security. This is a tension that is not unique to this conversation, though. For example, we'd probably all be safer if there was an FBI agent in everyone's living room. But we don't do that, because it'd be an egregious violation of our ability to self-actualize, to, to, to think and to feel and to act in a way where we don't feel we may be punished for it by the state. Further, we all probably like privacy. We would never vote for a law that says police can't go through a door that's locked. 
that would probably make fighting crime pretty hard. There's a trade-off that must always exist between privacy and security, but luckily for us, we're not the first people, like I said, to think about this. We have a solution. It's called a warrant. That's the bar that we as a society have decided is enough, that you can convince an independent adjudicator, we call them judges, that someone has or will commit a crime to that level of proof, they can enter your home, your car, anything. I contend that messages should be no different. President Barack Obama, two months ago at South by Southwest, said that if technologically we can implement an impenetrable device or system where the encryption is so strong that there is no key, there is no door at all, then how do we apprehend the child pornographer? How do we disrupt a terrorist plot? And that's the problem. With end-to-end -end encryption in play, one person gets to unilaterally decide that their privacy is worth more than everyone else's security. You don't get a say, a check, a balance, or any recourse. They get to make that decision. And I don't believe individuals should be able to make that decision for everyone else. But there, that doesn't mean there isn't a discussion about privacy. Specifically, some people suggest that these messages are, are the same thing as thoughts, that they're critical to who you are and personal in a way that we should not compel people to turn over. But I would point out that we still arrest people for inciting violence with their words or for telling someone else to do something that was a crime. By bringing that thought into the real world, you must be, we must be able to hold people accountable for the impact and the implications of what that message might do and what actions might be taken because of it. And more importantly, I believe that messaging is a lot more like writing a letter than it is like having an independent and personal thought. So now that I've shown you what the ban would look like and why the state should do it, there's still a question of, hey, David, what is this ban going to accomplish? I think it would have mattered in Paris. And I think it would have mattered in Brussels. Because we know after the fact that these terror organizations were using Telegram and they were using WhatsApp, messaging platforms that leverage end-to-end -end encryption to offer the highest degree of privacy. And because they were able to use these tools unchallenged, they created a significantly more sophisticated network. This is awful. First, because the sheer number of people who lost their lives was greater. But second, because the way that we perceive that attack is different. And that's the second point. Perception of terrorist attacks dramatically affects the way that we treat other people in our community. And that our, the way that we respond to predominantly Muslim communities is directly related to how terror unfolds. Let me explain. There is a difference between the San Bernardino shooting and the attack in Paris. When you can paint a narrative that this was a lone wolf or a single actor, the attack has a note of finality. It's over. We're safe again. Compare this to a network of people who you already see as otherized and two attacks within four months. It plays into the narrative that that people are attacking you, not an individual. This is why, after the Paris attack, President of France Hollande carpet-bombed parts of Syria. That's why a hundred doors were broken into without a warrant in the hours after the attack. But when you compare that to San Bernardino, there was a light discussion of gun control. I recognize that banning end-to-end -end encryption will not stop all terror attacks, but the way that they happen and the level of sophistication will be permanently altered. And the fact that we can do that means that not only will less people die, but the way that we perceive the attack and the way that we perceive the people responsible for it permanently changes in a way that is positive for everyone. But there's also a third impact. And it has to do with people who feel alone, isolated, and like they don't belong those who are most vulnerable and who are targeted by recruiters from places like the Islamic State. Recognize that those most vulnerable people do not start by downloading illegal software to go on the dark web to talk to a server in a foreign country. It's more organic than that. It has to be. It has to seem natural and by chance. And normally the perspective is we should not drive bad things into the dark. But I believe that pushing recruitment for things like the Islamic State into the very darkest recesses of the internet protects the most vulnerable because it decreases the chance of those by chance interactions. I believe it's a problem when you can message your mother, your best friend, and a combatant in Syria within the same app. I hope I've shown you why encryption is more than just a little lock in your browser when you go to your banking site why it matters, and why the decisions that we make as a society regarding the rules for encryption 
will determine our legal system, our judicial system, and our foreign policy for decades to come. Nations like the United States, places like Western Europe, have the unique opportunity and the capacity to fight back. What remains to be seen is whether or not they will. Thank you.